So uh, there's been a, a program change. Um, I, I've been asked to give an update on the uh, subtype, uh, integrated subtype pan cancer manuscript and exercising my ultimate power as chair for the session. I've bumped my own graduate student, Adrian, who is going to uh, talk at this slot. He, he'll be giving his presentation at the prostate uh, AWG meeting later today. So. Um, I apologize and, and, um, and say thank you to Adrian. So, um, so I wanna, I'm going to give an update on that, on this um, work that was done by the PANCAN subtype working group, uh, chaired by uh, Chuck Peru, uh, Chris Benz, and myself. So um, uh, I, I don't need to say much about where the data came from, but the, the pan cancer analysis, obviously, we stood on the shoulders of that work. Um, a lot went into that, and this, this data set that we used also was coordinated uh, by the same group, and we um, stuck to using the, those results so that we could have a, so that we could contribute to that, uh, that, that result archive. Um, so uh, we're talking about, about uh, 3,500 samples that we're um, going to try to uh, place into molecular classifications across tumor types, potentially, and ask the question, um, when we use uh, these multiple different uh, data sets, how, how do the, the tumors fall out? So more asking the question, um, do, do uh, cancers fall along tissue of origin boundaries, or do they um, tend to uh, form um, uh, um, clusters that reflect pathways or um, other types of molecular features? So that was the, uh, what we set out to do. Um, the, uh, I'm going to also put a shameless plug in for a, a resource we're trying to put in, put together to get an overview of this data. Um, most of you know that I, I really hate heat maps, so um, we have a, a tool that's going to create a, a browser for looking at this data um, uh, all in one place in, a, di in a, a slightly different way. And so just to give you a little primer on that, um, the, uh, the maps I'm going to show you um, for the results of the, of the subtype work are going to display samples in a particular address on a 2D plane. And each address, this is sort of the ultimate, I guess, socialistic uh, neighborhood, but you, everybody gets to occupy a hexagon. And so each sample will get assigned an address that maps to a hexagon. And um, we, lay out the, we lay out the samples based on their molecular similarity so that similar, uh, similar samples with common, uh, let's say, mRNA profiles will end up near, as neighbors on the map using techniques similar to these uh, uh, force embedded layouts that people um, work with. So that, that helps you because now you can look up um, a, a particular sample that you're interested in um, and then just look in the zip code where that, that sample came from and, and hopefully there are uh, um, samples nearby that, that share molecular similarities with it. Uh, so it makes uh, working with this data, uh, I think, a lot um, uh, nicer in some respects. So um, just to uh, show you an example, on the left is the uh, map um, that I'll show you a bigger picture of, but just um, zoomed in on the breast cancer uh, samples, and you can see that the basals um, separate well from the luminals, and the HER2s are sort of clustering in this mRNA space um, with the luminal B uh, tumor is shown in purple there. And um, then there's another layout we get for, the, for uh, deriving samples based on their similarity in pathway space. And so we can develop an, um, a number of these maps, one for each uh, different platform. And you can kind of consult the map to see if the, you know, the AWG subtypes, which we've loaded in, uh, match up to how the map is being laid out. So there's the endometrial subtypes on the mRNA layout. Um, and so on, GBM, here's the colorectal subtypes. And, and then you can um, you know, consult other maps to see if maybe there's a, a different map. In this case, this is the methylation map. Um, you can see that the colorectal subtypes actually dial out maybe better, um, and this one actually corresponds to the, the, uh, the uh, high uh, uh, um, MSI and stable tumors, um, which makes sense because we know that's correlated with the methylation status. So the working group took six different platforms. Uh, originally, it was five, but we, a we were asked by a referee to um, also incorporate mutations. And we each generated um, subtypes from these um, separate platforms on their own, and, um, and then um, um, set out to do analyses on these uh, platforms. So the clusters we got from each separate platform ranged in size from the smallest one from copy number. We had eight subtypes. Um, all the way up to 19 um, from the DNA methylation subtypes. Um, this is what it looks like on that tumor map I showed you. Each color now is a different, uh, a different um, 
subtype from the mRNA map. Um, so it's not tissue here I'm showing, but, but the cluster. And then um, here are the other subtypes that we, that we got for, the, for five of them. We, didn't, we don't have a layout for the mutations yet. So they correspond pretty well. The, the tumor map pretty much um, recapitulates the subtypes defined by the working groups. I think we might have some, uh, some work to do for some of these subtypes, and we're still working on how to process some of those data platforms. So the biggest news uh, first and the biggest uh, uh, signal was tissue of origin does, in fact, um, uh, correlate with these clusters that you get from each separate platform. The, each color now shows you the tissue uh, type, uh, the tumor type, and, um, uh, uh, and each one you can see that they all pretty much correspond. You see large swaths of the same color, so that means that the clusters have enrichment for tissue. Um, and then maybe the one that's sort of going against the rule, but you can still, still see big tissue of origin swaths is mutations may have a, uh, more of a, a tissue orthogonal axis. Um, and uh, this is on the tumor map. You can, now we're showing colors for the tissues. Of course, we recapitulate that the, that the maps are driven by tissue. So your eye should just see nice separation of colors, which, which you see. So um, how do you cluster this data? Uh, so Katie Holdley set out to to take these six different uh, um, subtypes and come up with one subtype to rule them all. And um, the answer we came up with was, well, we'll just let them all vote. Well, how do you let them all vote? Well, we just said, let's, let's um, you know, use the uh, US system of kind of like electro electoral votes. But, it, but the number of electoral votes that a, that a platform gets um, equals the number of clusters it came up with, basically. Um, which kind of defines the different types of orthogonal data in it. So she could make a new matrix, which has all the copy number subtype, um, call, uh, the copy number subtypes, the methylation subtypes, and so on. This gives you a new matrix, big binary matrix. Um, these are the samples, and you cluster this, this matrix, and she calls this the cluster of cluster assignments. So if I say COCA, that, that's the integrated subtypes, and, and we found 13 of them. Uh, a couple of them were tiny, so um, we, we um, analyzed uh, the, the bigger uh, 11 of them. So we have 11 main subtypes from that map. And um, uh, th when you view them in the context of all the other data specific platform subtypes, this is what you get. And you can see the nice correlation across all the platforms for these, for these subtypes. And, and of course, um, as you expect, tissue of origin does dominate with the enrichment for these clusters. So um, I think I can move on here. This is just the subtype map on the on the tumor map um, image that I showed you. So um, what kind of patterns do we see among these, these cancers? I mean, so do they, uh, do they tend, I, I already told you the dominant, dominant is that uh, tissue of origin kind of goes into a, one specific cluster. Well, there are some exceptions to the rule. These are the ones that sort of fall in the, in the tumor t uh, tissue of origin only uh, clusters. Um, and, but then there are some that, have, that d have different patterns. So the head and neck and lung squamous get co-clustered together into this squamous-like subtype. Um, colon and rectum, as, you, as we saw with the, work, with the working group for that paper, those get nicely clustered together. Bladder has an interesting story of getting uh, divergently clustered into um, one cluster on its own, which is mostly bladder cases, and then um, it, it clusters with the, uh, the, ad, the lung adenos and the, and the squamous-like cluster. And so we'll take a, a little bit closer look to that. And then there's um, a divergent pattern with the breast, um, so we all knew that luminals and basals were very different, but put in the context of a whole bunch of other tumor types, um, those actually look like uh, separate tissues in, in, this, in this context. So it kind of gives us um, a guideline for how to interpret just how different the basals are. Lee Ding's group um, di uh, looked at the copy number change, uh, the, uh, sorry, the mutation frequencies that were um, defined by these subtypes. and. Um, uh, basically, uh, as, as we kind of expected, there are three, only three genes, I guess, with 10% uh, or more frequency. Um, but there, there are others that um, were identified, and it keeps kind of going through that. The chromatin remodelers, if you add them all up, kind of account for um, plenty of the, of the samples. Um, and then Andy Cherniak um, uh, derived a copy number map that, that now has been ordered by these, uh, by the COCA subtypes. So you can see clear, distinct, um, copy number patterns that define these, these tumor types, especially you know, for the mixed types, we see some good um, patterns. And he could cluster, um, create, a, create a new clustering with that copy number map. Uh, ben Raphael's group then um, used HotNet2. He's got a poster upstairs um, where they could 
uh, use protein-protein interactions and find what uh, mutations are either uh, um, specific to a particular uh, subtype or, in this case, this core network um, defines uh, mutations that kind of link together lots of different tumors in multiple different subtypes. Sorry for the resolution there. Um, uh, so, you know, you can see the frequent ones, um, you know, P53, PIK3CA, P10 um, are shared in lots of different tumor types. And then there are some that he's laid out so that you can see what defines the squamous-like subtype that I mentioned before, some of those chromatin remodel remodelers like the MLL2s and 3s and um, EP300s in there, EGFR mutations and so on. You can say, so what? Um, who cares about the, the subtypes? Um, well, uh, we, uh, we looked at uh, whether, so you, you know, we already knew that tissue of origin defines different um, prognostic profiles, so you can look at overall survival and if there's clear difference in the tissue of origin. If you take the COCA subtypes, you also um, see that, but you wouldn't be surprised because I already told you that they fall along tumor, tissue boundary. Uh, so what Katie did was she was able to do um, an analysis where she kind of stacked up. Um, she first used the clinical data and, which, and showed how predictive the clinical data on its own were. It's this blue bar for predicting overall survival. And then you gain a lot more when you add either just the tissue type as a feature to predict, or if you add the COCA subtype as a feature to predict. But what was cool to see was you add um, independent information on top of just knowing tissue and the, uh, the clinical, the uh, COCA subtype actually does give you some small but um, significant and independent information about how to define um, these survival groups. So let's look at the bladder cases really quick. I told you that they diverge into three different subtypes. On the tumor map, this is what they look like. They fall into the, uh, the squamous um, on their own and in the lung adenos. Uh, these bladder cases um, also are uh, differentiated by their overall survival outcome. So the integrated subtype has something to say about these bladder cases. So the lung adenos and the lung squamous like uh, bladder cancers um, have poor survivor, survival outcomes than the other bladder island samples that, 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 I, that go into the other um, uh, C8 subtype. There are, are uh, genomic determinants that define these bladder cases, um, you know, copy number changes on, on, on chromosome 3, um, uh, 3 loss, and, um, and then uh, uh, Nuria Lopez's group could look at what what different uh, um, uh, mutations define the bladder cases. And again, there are these uh, chromatin remodelers that tend to happen in the squamous subtype for those bladder squamous-like cases. So um, we keep, I'm having trouble. Uh, then uh, um, John Weinstein's group led by Rehan could look for um, what defines the, the expression profiles in, in proteomic space. And um, consistent with, with what the working group was seeing for the bladder samples, we also find HER2, and this RAB25 protein is um, more expressed in these um, non-squamous bladder cases. And then for the squamous cases, we're seeing sort of an, um, uh, an epithelial to mesenchymal transition theme. Uh, the cadherins are in there, beta-catenins, and so on, um, that um, define the protein levels for the squamous-like um, uh, bladder cancers. Um, I haven't spent a, a, a lot of time talking about this analysis, but I'll just quickly show you and end with this. Uh, Denise Wolf from UCSF defined um, uh, 22 different gene programs, we call them. These are uh, sets of genes that were known to be functionally related. She found um, that, they're co that the ones that are co-regulated across um, the pan cancer 12 data set and then clustered them and came up with these 22 kind of um, orthogonal gene programs that we use. And so you can kind of look at all the um, COCA subtypes and see how they're correlated in, in, this, in this space. So, you know, just to get your bearings, um, this is the, the breast luminals, and they have, they're high in estrogen signaling, obviously. On the tumor map, you can look at this by just pulling up a, the, uh, like a weather map, we call it, for ER signaling. And you can see there's the breast luminals, and they light up with this ER um, estrogen um, signaling program really nicely. Uh, the kidney cancers, um, which primarily have VHL mutations and drive this signal, they, they have an upregulation in HIF1-alpha. You can look at that on the map. So here's the kidney cancer tumors there, and you can see that the hypoxia gene program that Denise defined is well lit up and, and distinguishes those tumor types. Um, the squamous set that I mentioned before um, was defined by, um, not surprisingly, squamous differentiation, and then this other group, um, basal signaling and, and a... And a a MAP kinase signaling cascade. So you can take a look at all these things on the tumor map. You can, you know, see the um, 
if you're interested in MIC amplification targets and their activity or this basal signaling program, you can pull up and see which tumor types are, um, are, uh, have higher activity in those profiles. And then you can even do an overlay to find maybe ones that kind of go against the general grain. Um, so I'm going to quickly conclude here, because um, I'm already over time. The, uh, we found an interesting story with P53 and that it may be the homologs may be compensating for P53 in the, in the squamous set. And that was um, led by Zhang Chen and, and Carter Van Weiss here. Um, so let me just say that um, the, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned, but it's now in press at cell. Uh, we're looking for covers, and um, uh, we've got some, a little bit of in, uh, uh, competition going on in the group. Katie Hoadley and, and Julia Zhang have been um, making the cover like this, and, um, and uh, uh, Zhang Chen has been making a more, maybe a more serious one. Um, I've had multiple versions of this, so you'll have to come, I guess, and vote on this tomorrow at the pancake breakfast, the second annual one tomorrow morning. Um, I, I, since I'm out of time, I'll just leave up this, uh, the, uh, the acknowledgments um, and take any, I'll take a, one question maybe. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, the question's about how we ha handle batch effects. So we, ha we have a whole batch effects committee that's run by MD Anderson, and um, they do, uh, the, do uh, principal component analysis derived type of methods or combat to take a look at whether it's worrisome or not. So they, they give us a report before we do any serious analyses. We did find some batch effect when we moved from uh, an RNA-seq platform midway through and then tried to identify which genes were um, were, uh, you know, so, and we had some samples where we had measured uh, the data on both of these batches, um, and uh, um, uh, we tried to mitigate that with uh, identifying which genes actually showed this batch effect and subtracting those away. I, I don't, maybe Katie can tell me and remind me exactly what we did. We throw out those genes um, that we found had that batch effect. I'm not sure if she's in the audience. Well, we can follow up with you. Yeah, so you have about 19 Yeah. So we basically, the 19 samples that were on both a GA and a high seq we used to figure out what the difference between the platform was and adjusted that to all of the GA2 data so that we kind of put them all in the high seq space. One small issue is that we're limited to just colon express genes, but it was the best we could do and we're hoping to get some more samples on both platforms to be able to help with that adjustment. Thanks for all that help answering the question. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Uh, it's Samir Armen from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, his title will be Profiling Long Intergenic Non-Coding RNA Interactions in the Cancer Genome. 